Chapter 13, A Fitting and Necessary Conclusion. All right, so the conclusion is getting towards the end here of Lincoln. The campaign for the new 13th Amendment had begun even before Lincoln launched his own campaign for a second term as president. In January 1864, Senator John B. Henderson of Missouri, a pro-war Democrat, submitted the first congressional resolution calling for a constitutional amendment outlawing slavery. Members of the Senate Judici Judiciary Committee started working on the draft with President Lincoln's old Illinois colleague, Lyman Trumbull, in the lead. As they labored over the language of the proposal, members of Congress began considering, too, a crucial and thorny procedural question. The law required that two-thirds of each body, both House and Senate, approve the constitutional amendment. But th did this mean two-thirds of those northern and border state legislators actually serving at the time in Congress, a supermajority that might be possible? Or did it mean two-thirds of all who were elected and legally entitled to serve, including the senator senators who had abruptly resigned? their seats at the onset of the secession crisis. No one believed it was possible to pass the resolution if it needed a two-thirds vote of the Senate as it was before the war. Eventually, the House and Senate majority, majorities, that is the Republicans, simply declared the passage would require approval by only two-thirds of those seated and voting. This milestone ruling vastly improved the odds for passage. That same month, Illinois Congressman Isaac N. Arnold visited Lincoln at the White House and offered his New Year's wishes. I hope, Mr. President, that on next New Year's Day, I have the pleasure of congratulating you on three events, which now seem very probable. What are they? First, that the war may be ended by the complete triumph of the Union forces. Second, that slavery may be abolished and prohibited through the Union by an amendment to the Constitution. Third, that Abraham Lincoln may have been reelected president. To which Lincoln replied with a smile, I think, my friend, I would be willing to accept the first two by way of compromise. Meanwhile, committee members worked to craft a simple resolution on which as many of them as possible could agree. This meant it would not deal with the dicey subject of equality before the law, as pro-abolitionist senators like Charles Sumner of Massachusetts hoped. The resolution would only ban involuntary servitude. The agreed-upon final resolution was straightforward, not enough for some and perhaps too much for others. Still, even the senators who proposed this simple act of justice felt they were taking a giant step for humanity, any risky one for their own careers. Section 1. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States, or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Jurisdiction means kind of where they rule in the kingdom, kind of. Section two, Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. That April, a full two months before the Republican convention was scheduled to begin, Congress began engaging in on the record discussions of the proposal on the House and Senate floors. At this historic moment, surprisingly, it was the Republican group that backed down. Like the president, many were facing reelection that fall. They feared that voters at home would turn against them and turn them out of office if they did anything that changed the status of African Americans. While Republicans hesitated, members of the Democratic Party unexpectedly began speaking out in favor of the amendment. Slavery was dying anyway, one of them pointed out. Why should the Democrats continue to support it? Could the party not gain far more influence by going, to the, going with the tide instead of against it? From a purely political point of view, Democrats began to imagine that if they successfully, successfully seized the slavery issue away from the Republicans, they would have a far greater chance of winning back majorities in the House and Senate, and perhaps the president's presidency too. Some abolitionists feared that the Democrats were only pretending to favor the amendment and would likely overturn it once they won back the White House. Lincoln's closest allies in Congress worried too that if the Democrats rallied behind the issue, the president would lose the credit he deserved as an emancipator. But all Friends of Freedom cheered when, in a dramatic development, border state Democratic Senator Reverdy Johnson came out eloquently in favor of the amendment. I never doubted, he said, the day must the day must one day come when human slavery must be terminated. 
the Chicago Tribune cheered. We doubt if the rebel cause has got a harder blow since Vicksburg was taken than it got in the Senate when Roberti Johnson laid his blows. The very next day, his home state of Maryland announced it would hold a convention to consider a measure of its own banning slavery. The tide was turning. Hey, there's a pretty cool um, graphic here. And it says in the caption, Americans of the day never doubted that Lincoln had pushed for the constitutional end of slavery. This montage of portraits entitled Congressional Supporters of the 13th Amendment showed Lincoln in a prominent position on the bottom, even though he was not a member of Congress. It's kind of cool. So here's Lincoln at the bottom here. In the end, however, it was not to be a truly bipartisan effort. Bipartisan means that both sides of the point are working together. Incurable racism stopped additional congressional Democrats from embracing Johnson's approach. As one party spokesman insisted, to free the slaves would be an act of cruelty to the race compared with which their actual extermination would be a blessing. After the brief brief democratic bubble, bubble for freedom burst, its original supporters concluded that the amendment faced a long fight and an uncertain future after all. While all this political maneuvering was playing out, anti-slavery Republicans resumed urging Lincoln to add his voice to those of the progressives who sincerely wanted slavery killed for nobler reasons. But until the Republican convention that June, Lincoln remained publicly silent on the issue. Why did Lincoln hold his tongue for so long? Hold his tongue, that's an idiom, means not talk about it, hold the tongue. One explanation is that he had had already exercised unheard of presidential power to declare emancipation. Now he needed Congress to act too, on its own, if necessary, to create the permanent constitutional authority to keep emancipation from being overturned. Moreover, he did not want freedom to become a political football in the coming presidential campaign. Keeping his silence was a big political risk, but for three years, Lincoln had shown that he was the smartest politician in town. He seemed to know exactly when to act and precisely when to hide. At this moment, he hid. When formal debate actually got underway, however, Johnson's bold change of heart failed to persuade his Democratic colleagues or free them from their fear of black equality. This government was made by white men and for white men, railed an angry Senator Lazarus Powell, and if it is ever preserved, it must be preserved by white men. Opponents began a whispering campaign suggesting that the amendment was merely a first step toward racial equality and intermarriage. Even some Republicans hesitated because of the equality controversy. Other opponents argued that the nation's founders had clearly endorsed the slave system and that even if their wishes could be reversed or modified, it was up to the states, not the federal government, to do the changing. Supporters like Senator Thomas Shannon of California countered by arguing that ending slavery forever would remove the evil that caused the bloody war in the first place. It would, as he put it, destroy the root of the accursed tree. Um, I better stop there.